So I'm very happy to open this year's Freke lectures. And it's like a long tradition already. And I'm more than happy to welcome Adam Toon from University of Exeter. And he's been, recently he's been working on mental fictionalism. And he had, has a book which came out, Oxford University Press, as Mind as Metaphor. He, last year he co-edited a book on mental fictionalism. <laughs> And before that, he had, in 2012, he had a book, Models as Make-Believe? Yeah, okay. So, so I think you're welcome to start. Thank you, uh, Bruno, and thank you very much um, for your kind invitation. I was very honored to, to be invited to, um, to, to be here. It's a, a Pleasure to be here and uh, to have a chance to, to talk to you all about um, uh, the, the story of the mind, Cartesianism, behaviorism, and, um, and fictionalism. It's uh, mm. an honor to be here, um, especially at the, the moment. We don't, we don't really get snow in Exeter, where I'm uh, from, so uh, it's an experience to be here. And Bruno's already been uh, giving me important survival tips, like not to walk under meter-long icicles hanging from the tops of, of buildings and so on. So I'm already learning a lot um, about, <laughs> about how to cope. I know my kids would be very jealous if they uh, saw all the, the deep snow. We, do, we have uh, had a, a little bit of snow a week ago in Exeter, but it just turns to slush straight away on the ground. And they, so they get very excited and then they get very disappointed when they see that it's not, it's not going to come to much. Um, so, uh, so I'm very grateful to you all for, for being here. Um, uh, I know I'm going to learn a lot from uh, talking to you all about this um, work. I hope that even if you are not convinced by uh, a lot of what I have to say, that you still um, uh, get something out of the, the discussions and for your own, your own work. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your, um, your thoughts. Um, I wanted to just start by giving a, a, an overview of the lectures as a whole, of what I'd, what I'd like to try and do in the, um, over the next three days. Um, the, the overall theme, I suppose, is a very general theme. The, the theme that I want to talk about is um, the, the nature of the mind. Um, and there are some questions, um, still quite, quite general questions, that follow from that that I'm going to be touching on in the course of the, the six uh, lectures. So, question of um, whether the mind exists, um, and if it does exist, in what, in what form. Um, so the question of what is the mind, what should we, uh, um, what should we say about the nature of the mind, um, if indeed it does exist. Uh, a slightly strange question, which has attracted a lot of attention lately in philosophy of mind, um, particularly under the heading of um, 4E cognition, extended cognition, um, the question of where the mind is, which I'm going to say is a slightly strange question, and that if we um, think about why that's a strange question, we can help make some progress and talk about uh, the extended mind in particular. Um, and I'm going to touch on uh, some uh, related um, questions throughout the, um, the lectures. So the question of what the relationship is between mind and language, um, what the relationship is between mind and, and world, um, and a, a question that, of course, was very important for um, the British empiricists in particular, so Locke, Barclay and Hume, uh, what are the limits of mind? We say something about the limits of human, human understanding, and I'm going to come to that question um, in, the, in the final lecture. Um, and my title hints at three very uh, general ways of approaching those questions that I'm going to be talking about for... Um, uh, um, during the course of the lectures, but particularly in the first three um, lectures in particular. Um, one, uh, again, very, very general um, approach. I won't be using this term Cartesianism with a lot of historical accuracy, I'm afraid to say, but I kind of think that when you become as influential as Descartes, it's just a sign of how influential you are that people keep taking your name for all sorts of positions that you may not have, have signed up to. So um, what I mean by Cartesianism is something quite general, the view that in some sense the mind is an inner world. Um, and that's a, a very common view, I think, in in philosophy, but also in culture more generally, that you know, if you say to someone, um, if you ask them the slightly strange question, where is your mind? The temptation of a lot of us is to point 
um, here. Um, and, uh, and that view, as I'm going to say, takes lots of different forms, perhaps um, a few hundred years ago, um, people uh, may have been more attracted to the idea that mind was something like um, spirit or it was a particular kind of substance. Nowadays, of course, lots of us um, uh, see ourselves as sort of very hard-nosed materialists and so are more likely to um, locate the mind in the brain in a part of the physical world. Uh, nevertheless, there's, um, whether you are more of a dualist persuasion or materialist, um, it's very common to, to think of the mind as something like a, um, an inner world, and that's a view that I'm going to be um, grouping together under this fairly general heading of, of Cartesianism, and, uh, and I'll, I'll be trying to give reasons um, to think that that's not the right approach to, to the mind, particularly in the, the area of thought which I'm going to be talking about. Um, so that's, that's one very um, prominent current in, in thinking about the, the mind. Um, so prominent, in fact, that if you deny that there is such an inner world, you're often seen as simply denying the existence of, of mind. So when we talk about the existence of mind, that's, that's typically um, uh, what we might mean. Uh, of course, there have been notable attempts within um, philosophy, but also related disciplines like psychology, um, to try to get rid of that inner world, to think that it's um, problematic, either for methodological reasons or for... Um, more purely philosophical reasons, and to try to get rid of it. And, and behaviorism, again, I'm using as a quite a general term to um, uh, bring together lots of approaches that will say, in some sense, you need to get rid of that idea that the mind is an inner world, um, and um, focus not on some inner realm, either in the brain or uh, something non-physical, like um, uh, uh, mind stuff, um, but to focus on the outer world of behavior. Okay. Um, so we've got, if you like, um, two uh, sort of extreme poles that I'm going to be exploring. One, Cartesianism, that takes the mind to be something hidden, something inner. And on the other hand, various versions of behaviorism that seek to um, get rid of that notion of the inner world, the mind to do without it, and to focus instead on behavior. And I'm going to pose, uh, propose what's um, fairly unfashionable politically nowadays, but in the 90s, third ways, so some sort of in-between um, centrist position was, uh, uh, was popular, um, which I'll be calling fictionalism. So, so roughly speaking, the idea here is going to be that, um, uh, that we do have this notion of mind as an inner world, um, but that it's a useful fiction. So on the one hand, Cartesianism is wrong to say that um, there is this inner world, right? this inner world doesn't exist. But on the other hand, the behaviorist project of trying to do away with that notion of an inner world, to get rid of it, um, uh, um, is not tenable. Right? So, so we have this kind of intermediate position that says, yes, we have this notion of an inner world. Um, the mind, to put it loosely, um, is an inner world, um, but that inner world doesn't exist. It's a useful fiction. Right? And in particular, I'm going to suggest that that inner world is... Um, a particular kind of fiction, or it's a metaphor um, that's a projection of the outer world of language and human culture inwards. So we talk as if people have um, many of the aspects of, of human culture and language um, uh, um, inside within their inner world. Okay, so that's, that's the, the general idea that I want to explore. And as, as Bruno mentioned, there's a couple of um, works in which I've um, uh, explored um, similar ideas. Uh, in the background here is some of the work I've done on philosophy of science. So I was originally uh, trained in philosophy of science. That's where a lot of my research has been um, uh, based. And I've been particularly interested in scientific models. And one of the striking things about scientific models is that they are not true, that we know that they're not true, um, and that they involve, in a sense, treating the world as if it were some way simpler, more idealized, um, in a way that we know um, that the world isn't, and yet treating it as, as if it were simpler, more idealized, is the way in which we can, um, we can begin to understand it, to predict the behavior of various systems, and, and arguably to explain them as well. And I've been interested in, in the um, a book I wrote, gosh, 10 years ago now, um, Models as Make-Believe, the idea was to try to understand that kind of thinking in science, that um, as if thinking on, uh, by drawing on work on um, uh, philosophy of fiction. Right? So, and I'll, I'll 
say more about how that's that's meant to go um, in the lecture this afternoon. Um, so, so a lot of my work has been interested in how to understand representation in science, particularly how to understand modeling that this kind of as if representation of the world that according to some philosophers of science, um, such as Nancy Cartwright, is, uh, is everywhere in scientific reasoning. Uh, um, uh, one view, almost every time we have to apply, we want to apply a theory to the world, we have to treat the world as if it were um, a way that we know it isn't. Okay. And I've been interested in that thinking in general. Um, one way to understand the book that, that I wrote that Bruno mentioned that came out this year is a kind of application of that uh, idea to the mind. So to, to think about the, the, um, the questions that we ask about the mind that I've just uh, outlined by thinking about this very common mode of reasoning in the sciences and arguably in everyday life in which we try to understand some system by treating it as if it were, um, were different in some way. And in particular, I'm going to argue that we understand people by treating them as if they had minds, by which I mean as if they had inner worlds. Okay. And that's, so um, on this view, um, that I'm going to suggest, the kind of um, as-if thinking that we get in our talk about the mind is a, of a much more general category that you find across the sciences and, and arguably in everyday life uh, as well. Okay, so the, the plan for the, the lectures and how I'm going to divide up the discussion will be I want to start today by talking about um, what I mean by Cartesianism um, and um, and sort of beginning to set out how I want to approach these very general and, and difficult questions about the mind to present the, the Cartesian view in some of the ways that in which it, it uh, has appeared within recent philosophy of, uh, of, science, of philosophy of mind um, and then uh, towards the end of the lecture to give you a kind of quick overview of the alternative of the fictionalist alternative that I want to that I want to put forward and then this afternoon I'm going to say more about the fictionalist view um, uh, in lecture two, the public lecture, and try to um, to spell it out and give you some reasons for thinking it's at least uh, more plausible than it might seem at first glance. Um, and then in, um, tomorrow, in the, the um, I'm going to turn to behaviorism and try to show you that there are some advantages to fictionalism over um, behaviorism. And in the final three lectures, then I want to begin to trace out some of the implications for this view of the mind for questions about where the mind comes from. Um, what its boundaries are, so there I have in mind work on ex the extended mind and for recognition. Um, and in the final lecture, to suggest that one upshot of this view is that mind has a history. And that's, that's something that um, is uh, and perhaps not a, a very common um, view in the sense in which I'll mean it, but I'm going to try and show you how if you accept this kind of way of thinking about the mind, you'll see that the, um, the mind has changed um, uh, quite dramatically over time. Right, so um, Cartesianism. So to start on the first lecture, I shouldn't have put a picture of poor old Descartes up here because, it, it, as I said, uh, the way in which I'm going to use this term is um, uh, uh, is, is not, uh, arguably not historically um, accurate, but it's such a lovely, lovely portrait that um, I'm, I'm sure he won't mind. Um, what I want to do uh, in um, this morning's lecture is to um, first of all say something about um, folk psychology, what's meant, what I mean by folk psychology as a starting point for addressing some of these questions about, about the mind. Um, and then I want to, to narrow the focus a little bit. I have the feeling when I was putting together these lectures that um, on the one hand, uh, I'm uh, covering an awful lot of topics that I'm sure many of you are um, more expert in than, than I am, so I'm already covering too much ground. Um, nevertheless, there are still a lot of things I don't say anything about um, that uh, arguably I should, and that's, I guess, the nature of philosophy. Um, so I want to and, and want give a sense of which aspects of the mind I'm going to be focusing on, and that's thoughts. Um, and then I'll talk about the Cartesian view and some of the forms that it takes. Uh, and then, as I said, towards the end of the lecture, um, try to give you a sense of my alternative and to look ahead to the next five lectures to indicate where there are some, hopefully, some promise in this view, but also problems and challenges that I'm going to I'm gonna have to try and address. OK, so um, here, are, here are some of the, the big questions that I mentioned at the start. Um, 
you know, um, the nature of the mind, does the mind exist? What is the mind? Where is the mind? These are the sorts of questions that Ian Hacking at one point says, you, you mention questions like this and then the stomach grumbles and you start to wonder how on earth you're going to begin to make progress. And so you have to sort of pick, of course, a, a method, a starting point for, for trying to address these questions. And there are lots of different starting points you could, you could take. Uh, I'm going to begin um, from uh, a starting point that's fairly common in the, in the literature. So there's nothing especially controversial about this. But, but nevertheless, I need to say something about it. Um, and the, uh, the way in which I understand it, and that's folk psychology. So I want to start trying to look at some of these big questions that we ask about the nature of the mind um, by beginning with um, what's often called um, folk psychology. And by this, I mean something fairly uh, general, and I hope fairly neutral, although it's always hard to find a neutral starting point within, within philosophy, of course. And um, by saying, uh, talking about folk psychology, I mean something like our ordinary concept of mind. So I have in mind um, uh, here um, the same sorts of things, I hope, that Ryle, Gilbert Ryle, was uh, talking about in his book, The Concept of Mind. So our ordinary, everyday talk about the mind um, when we're not doing philosophy, right? when we're not um, asking ourselves typically uh, very explicit questions about the, you know, we're not asking ourselves the questions that uh, I said I want to ask about what the mind is or where it is. We're just um, using our uh, concept of mind to get around the world, to make sense of other people and make sense of, our, of ourselves. Okay. So, um, and I'm gonna talk about what seems to be involved anyway in that ordinary concept of mind. We're going to see it's, um, given that this is something that's supposed to be awfully familiar to us, that we use uh, all the time uh, in everyday life, it turns out to be surprisingly difficult. It turns out to be a lot of controversy of what's involved, of course, in our uh, ordinary concept of mind. Um, but I want to say something about how I'm going to approach it to forestall some possible um, criticisms or areas where um, there would um, need to be much more said than I'm going to. So. The first thing to say is, on the face of it, what I'm doing, the method I'm using here is good old-fashioned armchair conceptual analysis. Right? So, so, of course, we've had in the you know, past few decades a lot of talk about burning the armchair. I don't have an armchair, actually, in my, in my office, but nevertheless, I'm a fan of armchairs, and there's nothing particularly unacceptable about them, I don't think. So I'm doing something like, uh, in, a, uh, I'm sure, a much less sophisticated way, what somebody like Ryle might have taken themselves to be doing. I'm trying to think about our ordinary concept of mind from, from the armchair. But there are some uh, assumptions that many of you will be familiar with that come with this term folk psychology, which I won't be adopting. And I wanted to just talk about some of those. So, so quite often when you hear this term folk psychology, there's some assumptions that quite naturally go along with that that I won't be making. So one has to do with it being a theory. Another has to do with it being universal and um, something that's fixed over time. So I wanted to, to just uh, run quite quickly over these and we can return to these in the discussion. So sometimes when people use the term folk psychology, they um, uh, take that term to imply that what we're talking about is a theory. It's something like a rudimentary uh, um, scientific theory that the folk use. Um, and part and parcel of that, in some of the classic discussions at any rate, is the thought that um, it has a certain sort of structure. So it has, uh, as is often assumed, but it's controversial within philosophy of science, but it's often assumed that scientific theories include um, universal generalizations, for example, um, uh, in, uh, laws of nature that are then connected to um, to the world by various principles. Um, and when people talk about folk psychology, they sometimes, um, in some classic discussions, have meant to commit to the idea that our ordinary talk about the mind has that sort of structure. There are some implicit um, generalizations or laws that we're making. Um, so that's a, a claim about structure that I won't be assuming. In fact, I'm going to give a much messier description of folk psychology than that. Um, and another thing that's sometimes meant by saying that folk psychology is a theory is to talk about the commitments that it involves. In particular, and I'm going to come back to this, um, uh, it's sometimes taken to be committing to the idea that um, mental states, beliefs, desires in particular, are something like theoretical entities like atoms or atoms. 
uh, mass force and so on. Um, and I'm going to be rejecting both of those assumptions. So by folk psychology, I don't mean that it has this structure of having uh, implicit um, laws, for example, or that it treats beliefs and desires as um, uh, theoret theoretical entities like electrons. Another view that sometimes goes hand in hand with talking about folk psychology is the thought that um, this, this approach to thinking about the mind is uh, universal. Sometimes it's said to have kind of uh, evolutionary origins. It's an innate capacity that we have um, to uh, um, help us to explain and predict the behavior of other people. Um, now, again, that's something that I won't be committing to, and in fact, as we'll see as I go along, that one of the um, consequences of the view I'm going to put forward is that folk psychology won't, uh, shouldn't be expected to be universal. So I'm going to put forward a view that will suggest that, in fact, um, we should think that different cultures are likely to have different concepts of mind, for instance. Um, and a similar uh, aspect that I've mentioned already is um, uh, uh, sometimes folk psychology, when people have used this term, and I'm thinking particularly of people like Paul Churchland, who are not always terribly positive about folk psychology, um, they tend to think of it as something, um, if not ahistorical, then pretty stable. Right? So here's a, a well-known quote from Churchland. He says, the content and success of folk psychology um, uh, have not advanced sensibly in two or 3,000 years. The folk psychology of the Greeks is essentially the folk psychology we use today. I, I spoke to a, a colleague who works in classics who suggested there's no way you could possibly support a view like that because we just don't, don't have any evidence for what you know, your, your Greek man or woman on the street would have, would have said in these situations. I'm not a classicist. Leaving that aside, I'm not committing to this idea. So as I said, in the last lecture, I'm going to suggest that we should expect there's been change in our concept of mind uh, over the course of the last 2,000 years or so. Um, and so when I talk about folk psychology, I don't mean to suggest something that is, that is fixed in that, in that way. Perhaps there is some stability. Perhaps there's also quite a lot of, quite a lot of change. Okay, so, um, so what do I mean by folk psychology? I mean something that uh, does not have, or at least I'm not committing to it having, the classical structure, what sometimes in philosophy science called the received structure of, uh, the, um, of theories, so having um, uh, general laws for example, um, or committing to the existence of um, uh, mental states uh, in the same way as theoretical entities. Uh, and I'm not assuming that this, uh, our understanding of mind is universal or that it's been fixed over time. And you might think, well, why bother then? Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've asked some very general questions about the nature of mind, and now I've um, reduced my focus to something like our conception of mind as it exists, uh, and I say our with, uh, the um, uh, implicit caveat that I mean uh, something like, um, well, I hope not just me in my philosophy room, but also people I talk to who are not philosophers uh, in my neck of the woods, but not much more than that. Right? So you might think, well, why, why bother? Right? Why, why um, start with this uh, concept of mind if you think it's um, something that's so uh, um, sort of restricted to uh, culturally and historically specific, um, there's a, a kind of more defensive response there to say, well, where else should I begin? <laughs> right? So, you know, I need to start somewhere. These questions are very difficult. Um, and uh, I might as well start with um, at least what we have, which is a, um, hopefully some sort of um, quite competent grasp of what other people think and want and uh, and so forth. I may as well start there, even if I end up revising some of the um, uh, commitments of folk psychology. And in fact, I am going to suggest that um, our ordinary talk about the mind is at least potentially misleading. Right? So starting here doesn't mean that we have to end here. Um, perhaps more substantially, though, um, it seems to me that it's well worth starting with this concept of mind, because even if it is only our concept, uh, of mind, it also sets our problems. So I have in mind something like a, a, a sort of um, Wittgensteinian idea here of philosophy as therapy, um, so that you know some of the classic problems that we um, worry about with the nature of the mind, so the mind-body problem, of course, uh, skepticism about uh, the external world, the problem of other minds, and so on, arguably begin from our particular conception um, 
And the reason that we pose these problems, or at least the reason we pose them in the way that we do, is because we begin with a particular conception of the mind. Um, and along with um, uh, lots of other thinkers, this isn't, of course, uh, anything especially new, um, I want to suggest that um, if we uh, begin with a different concept of mind, we see that there's something mistaken about the way that we're thinking about the mind, some of these problems go away, dissolved. Okay. So, so even if we're beginning something with something fairly um, culturally and historically specific, it could be that it's set up uh, particular problems of mind, um, at least since Descartes, and then if we manage to um, undermine some of these assumptions, then perhaps those problems um, won't begin to seem so, so pressing. Now, um, suppose that we accept what, I, what I've said and, and begin with ordinary talk about the mind. The first thing to notice, of course, especially if we're dropping the assumption that we have here something like a, um, a, a scientific theory or a rudimentary theory in the very um, clear way that that was uh, often understood in, in philosophy of science, um, uh, the starting point we should notice, of course, that it's a mixed bag, right? by which I mean it's not at all obvious that there is uh, a very simple structure to our ordinary talk about the mind. Um, and in particular, of course, um, uh, you can make a very rough and ready um, uh, list of all sorts of different um, states, acts, processes, all sorts of things that, we, that come under this um, this heading. Um, so we might think about uh, what I'll be calling thoughts, like beliefs and desires or intentions. We might think about sensations, so um, feeling of pain, uh, and, you know, uh, the perception I get when I look at the snowy street outside, what have you. Um, of course, we talk about emotions and all sorts of different emotions, that, um, happiness, fear, joy, not, not all of which are uh, obviously the same sorts of things. Uh, and then there are character traits, We're talking about someone being a confident person or a vain person, what have you. Um, so there's an awful lot, and I don't want to be assuming, and this is a theme that will come up throughout the lectures, I don't want to assume a great deal of um, a, a uniformity or neatness there that isn't there. Right? Um, and you might think, well, where should we focus then? And I'm going to focus on thoughts uh, in particular, um, by which I have in mind something like what philosophers would, would call um, propositional attitudes. So here's a, a list, right? beliefs, desires, intentions, hopes, fears, decisions, judgments. Um, and I'll also mention a few uh, um, aspects of mind that even if they're not themselves propositional attitudes, or in some cases if it's debatable whether they are propositional attitudes, at least seem fairly closely related. So concepts would be uh, an example, of course, that are um, according to many, uh, something like constituents of, of propositional attitudes, um, reasoning, um, understanding. There's a, a, a lively debate within recent epistemology and um, philosophy of science about the nature of understanding, whether it really boils down to propositional attitudes or not. So I won't be, I'll come back to understanding later on in the, the lectures. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, this is the rough territory I, I want to be, um, to be focusing on. Why pick that? <laughs> Well, um, partly because, rightly or wrongly, a lot of the um, debate within philosophy of mind, as you, uh, many of you will know, have, has focused on um, proposition attitudes, particularly beliefs and desires. So they're often, it's often just said that the heart of folk psychology is um, the attribution of beliefs and desires, for instance. That may be, that may be wrong, um, but it's certainly structured a lot of the debate on the topic. Um, again, the more positive reason here is that uh, if we think back to some of the classic problems that I've mentioned about, um, uh, say, the problem of skepticism about the external world and so on, thought, of course, plays a, a key role. So, you know, um, Descartes um, told us that he thinks, therefore he is, um, and there's at least an initial reason for thinking that, that thought uh, is crucial to, say, uh, inquiry. We often worry about whether our, um, we have knowledge of the external world and just assume that that's a matter of having um, uh, propositional attitudes like beliefs that are properly backed up, true, and so on. So, so there's at least a reason for thinking that um, this is a good place to start for, um, given the way the debate's gone, and also for trying to diffuse some of the, the important problems that I, that I mentioned. But I want to just say here that I'm not uh, um, trying to say that other aspects of the mind aren't important. And in particular, in lecture three, I'm going to come back to sensations and, and try to say something about how they fit in with this, uh, the approach that I'm going to put forward. Okay, so 
What do the folk think about thoughts? Um, I guess is the, the question now. Not, uh, say, not as easy a question as you might think. You might think, well, this is just a sort of easy starting point and then all the philosophical worries will come after this once we just give a, an easy description of what we uh, say about thoughts. Um, uh, but it turns out to be, of course, a lot more difficult than that. Um, here's some reminders of um, what at least a lot of the tradition has said about thoughts. Um, so I got, um, thanks to Bruno's help, I got the coach, uh, the bus here from the airport yesterday. Um, and so uh, I had this uh, set of beliefs and desires. I believe the number um, 129 bus goes to, to Tartu and I had the desire to get here so that I was here for for lectures, had at least those beliefs and desires, had a lot of worries about whether the bus stop I was standing at in the snow was the correct bus stop and so on, but I had at least these beliefs and desires. And if someone had wanted to, um, had been puzzled by why, for instance, I was standing at that particular bus stop uh, looking a bit um, uh, concerned and expectant at um, five past one yesterday when the bus should have been there but wasn't, um, they could have offered this uh, they could have been asked, challenged to give an explanation, you know, why is Adam getting the bus number 129? Um, and you might have uh, removed the sense of puzzlement that they had by saying, well, you know, um, he thinks the 129 goes to Tartu and um, uh, uh, he wants to go there. Okay, so you might explain the pattern in my behavior, like me getting on the 129 bus when it arrives by citing these particular beliefs and desires. You'd probably be more likely to cite this if I got on the wrong bus, if I got on the number 100, for instance, and someone said, why is he getting on the number 100? And you said, oh gosh, he thinks the 100 goes to Tartu, but it doesn't. Right? Then um, uh, that's more of a situation in which we, in everyday life, we'd be likely to um, to give explanations, as Ryle pointed out, we often give explanations when things start to go wrong. Um, nevertheless, this looks like one pattern of explanation that we um, that we would uh, engage in everyday life. Um, now, uh, if you uh, had come to me half an hour earlier uh, and wondered, as I was sitting there in the airport having my cup of coffee, what will he do next? You know, you've been really excited at what my next movements might be. You could, instead of make, giving an explanation, have offered a prediction. Um, well, uh, I think um, this is a, a person who has the um, belief that number 129 goes to Tartu and wants to go to Tartu. And given that the number 129 is coming along in half an hour, I predict that in the next half an hour, he'll stand up put his coffee cup in the bin and walk outside to the bus station and your prediction would have turned out to be to be right. Okay, so, so the, the basic thought here, of course, is that um, in everyday life, we're constantly um, uh, making, giving explanations, or offering predictions for what people will, will do um, by mentioning what they think, what they want, what they need and so on, um, and what they intend to do, what they plan to do, um, and um, Typically, we don't give it much thought. Right? We just do these things routinely. If someone said, you realize that you're operating with a folk concept of mind there, we probably uh, would have to stop for a moment and uh, um, realize we're talking to a philosopher or a psychologist. Right? Okay. Um, now, so again, with the tradition here, I'm emphasizing explanation and prediction. There are, and this has received a lot of attention lately, there are other purposes, other um, functions of the concept of mind. And I'm going to come back to those in, uh, in lecture five. But nevertheless, let's, let's focus on explanation and prediction. Now, there are, there are three at least apparent features that that talk about the mind has that are, are very um, much emphasized. So this particular aspect to talk about the mind that focuses on thoughts, um, uh, that it has, that thoughts have content, Right? that um, my belief is about, uh, as philosophers say, about the bus and Tartu, um, that as a result it can be true or false, for instance. So we um, use terms like intentionality and aboutness to, to focus on this. Um, that these um, uh, uh, states not only have content, but also have causal power. So why did I get up from the table, throw my coffee cup away and walk outside? Well, because roughly speaking, my um, desire to go to Tartu and my belief that the 129 bus goes there and was leaving in 15 minutes uh, caused me to stand up and walk. Right? So these, uh, at least on the face of it, it seems like our folk concept of, of thoughts um, uh, takes them to have contents, to be about the world, things that can be true or false, and to be causes. 
And the third feature is trickier, and of course, we're going to keep coming back to this, but at least on the face of it, it seems that our ordinary talk about the mind takes these things, takes thoughts to be hidden in some way. Rather. What do I mean by this? Well, I don't mean that you'd be in any doubt right, if I said to you, oh, gosh, my bus leaves in 15 minutes, I better go, and I got up and run. I don't think you'd be any in any doubt about at least some of the beliefs and desires that I, that I have. Nevertheless, it seems as if the beliefs and desires that I have are not, as it were, immediately present in the behavior that I'm exhibiting at that moment. They're certainly not just me saying, gosh, you know, the bus leaves in 15 minutes. Or even if I'd said, rather un implausibly, I believe the number 129 bus goes to Tartu, even then, of course, it seems strange to say my belief just is me saying that. We're perfectly well aware that I could have that belief and not say it, which is very likely or very unlikely, but possible, I could say it and not have the belief. I, I might have um, had a very difficult two hour conversation with you in the cafe and you tell me you're going to Tartu as well and I might be tempted to lie and tell you that the bus 100 goes to Tartu just so that we can go our own separate ways and I don't have to spend two and a half hours uh, on the coach talking to you. I, I wouldn't do that sort of thing, but people do lie. Um, and so, so at least there's an initial thought that, well, our beliefs and desires are not, as it were, immediately there in our behavior, but are something in some sense hidden. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. Okay. Now, so the key question then is how should you understand this practice? We're doing this all the time. We're saying Adam's going there because he wants to go to Tartu. Adam's going to that bus stop because he thinks the number 100 and 29 goes to Tartu, what have you. Um, how are we supposed to understand that? What exactly are we doing when we say these things about people? Um, what makes the things we say true or false? And as I've said, there's a, a very common view about what's happening here that um, I'm going to label um, uh, in not a historically accurate way as Cartesianism, right? which says, well, that talk about the mind is something like a theory of an inner world, a theory of inner machinery in particular. Now, as I've said, this is uh, a few times, this is not uh, historically accurate, of course, in the way in which um, I'm presenting this is rather different to um, the way in which lots of early modern thinkers would talk about this. So I'm particular, I'm talking a lot about a kind of third person perspective of explanation and prediction, whereas it's really introspection, of course, that figures um, prominently in, um, uh, in a lot of early modern uh, thinkers. Um, Elimitivism, which I'm going to talk about, as a, uh, arguably in my categorization counts as a kind of Cartesianism, begins with the same starting point that the folk are talking about an inner world, um, but Elimitivism is something very, very different from what um, uh, many people would normally um, uh, describe as Cartesianism. Um, and perhaps more substantively, it's, it's important to say that when I say Cartesianism, I don't mean the same thing as dualism. And this can, these two views can come apart in two different ways. So one way I've talked about already, if Cartesianism, I mean it as the thought that a folk psychology is a theory of inner machinery. And a lot of people, for instance, in cognitive science would accept that view, but of course they wouldn't be dualists. They would think that our inner machinery is really, um, in some sense, physical. Perhaps it's the brain. On the other hand, perhaps more interestingly, there can be views that you might want to describe as dualist but which don't count as Cartesian in the way I'm talking about it. So some ancient theories of mind, like Plato's, might take the mind to be something um, not of the, of the material world, not of the physical world, but yet not think of it as something hidden and inner and certainly not as inner machinery. So, so, um, so dualism and um, uh, Cartesianism in the way I'm using the terms can, can certainly uh, come apart. Um, but a key comparison in the way this view is often motivated nowadays, as I've said, is to draw a comparison with a particular understanding of scientific theorizing. It was to say that, roughly speaking, thoughts are like electrons. Right? That if a scientist in the laboratory carries out certain observations, um, why does she think that electrons exist if she does? Well, because positing these um, uh, unobserved things offers um, the best explanation for the observable um, results in the experiment, for instance. Um, and one analogy that's often used to motivate this view of folk psychology is that's roughly what the folk are doing. They're positing something, as I've said, that's hidden and inner. In particular, they're, they're positing inner states with content and causal powers to explain what they can observe, which is someone's behavior. Okay. Um, now, 
If you accept that starting point, then there's a very natural question that follows. If you think that what the folk are doing is theorizing about inner machinery, they're offering a kind of theory of an inner world and, and, and a mechanism that drives behavior, then a very natural question is, is that theory true or false? Right. And roughly speaking, um, uh, there are people that go either way. Um, you can, a classic um, uh, representation or a version of the view that, um, uh, that the theory of true, of course, is uh, representationalism, and particularly uh, in um, nowadays we would associate this with uh, Jerry Fodor. So think that there really are these inner states with content that drive our behavior, and what John Helgeland called good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, of course, is one way of trying to, um, to make sense of that, to give a kind of materialist vindication of folk psychology. On the other hand, you could be much more um, pessimistic and think that in fact the folk will turn out to be wrong and that beliefs and desires won't exist, right? will turn out not to exist. And um, a key uh, proponent of that, of course, is Paul and Patricia uh, Church. And so I want to just um, quite quickly uh, give an overview of what those two views look like and then um, in the remaining time to, to give you uh, an alternative. So, um, so what does the representationalist say? Well, that, the, that our ordinary talk about thoughts is a claim about inner machinery. And roughly speaking, in, the main, in its main um, outlines, it turns out to be true. In other words, we really do have um, inner states with um, the contents of our beliefs that cause us to behave in certain ways. Um, and those states are hidden because they're inner, either because they're in uh, some sort of non-physical medium uh, or because they're um, in our brains and we don't see them directly. So, you know, on this view, my belief that the number 129 goes to Tartu is some kind of inner state that has that content and that causes me to jump up from the table uh, and rush out to the bus stop. Okay. Um, and as I've said, that view comes in lots of different forms. Um, uh, there are um, arguably uh, proponents of this view who are dualists, like Descartes, who think that these inner items with content are not physical. Um, on the other hand, there are those who uh, have something like this view but are idealists. Right? So I think that, um, uh, that the um, uh, apparently um, external world is uh, also in some sense ideas, ideas in the mind of God. Um, or you can um, of course, see materialist versions of this idea, so we're going back to Hobbes. Um, and there are different versions of uh, what these inner representations can be taken to be. So you can think that they're, they're more image-like, the classic view of the British empiricists like this, or um, that they're more language-like, um, uh, like Hobbes and Fodor. Okay. But the important point that I want to make here is, despite all of that disagreement and all the important questions that you can ask there, they begin from this common starting point of thinking that thoughts are inner representations. And then the question is, what, what's their metaphysics? What form do they have? And so on. And as I've said, um, the classic formulation of this view um, nowadays, of course, is um, what's often called computationalism or the computational uh, theory of mind. Um, and in the classic form by like Fodor, it will take these beliefs and desires to be um, sentences in the language of thought. And the what computationalism seems to give us, the promise of computationalism seems to be um, a way of explaining how it is that these inner representations could have um, causal powers. Okay. Um, now, of course, there are challenges to that view too, and one that I'm very important challenge that I'm going to come back to is how it explains um, how it will explain how these inner representations have content. I'm going to come back to that in lecture four. Now, the other more pessimistic route, of course, is to think that um, uh, the folk are wrong. Right, to think that, um, yes, folk psychology is making a set of claims about inner machinery, but unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, like how in the case of some of these beliefs, like the belief in you know, um, witches, phlogiston, crystalline spheres, and so on, um, will just turn out to be wrong. And there are no such things. So um, now, why would you have that view? Well, it depends what you think the folk are committed to. So fire, Paul Feyerabend, um, you know, uh, in a, an early version of, of eliminativism, um, uh, it seems to adopt the view that the folk, our ordinary concept of mind, is somehow committed to dualism. And if you think dualism's got to go, then you think that there are no um, beliefs and desires, no mental states. Um, we've already seen that Churchland thinks this is a theory that hasn't really changed very much in 2,000 years. So stagnation seems to be one reason why um, it's pessimistic, or that there are certain areas it just doesn't um, give us any grip on, like mental illness or 
and it gives sleep and creativity. Or you could think that, uh, in fact, our best science of the mind and connectionism was a, a, a classic focus here. Um, it's just at odds with folk psychology in important respects, and that's why we ought to reject it. Right? It turns out our best science of the mind shows that beliefs and desires don't exist. Okay. Now, for the, the time remaining, I want to introduce a, an alternative view, um, which, as I've said, lies in some sense um, uh, to one side of, of uh, um, a Cartesianism, um, which is to say um, folk psychology, in fact, is not a theory of inner machinery. So to reject that starting point that leads both to representationalism and to eliminativism. Um, and I want to offer a particular version of that view that says that folk psychology is metaphorical. And I'm going to try and spell that out by drawing on a particular theory of metaphor in terms of pretense. So now I should say here that um, although uh, mental fictionism isn't uh, um, perhaps the best known view on the philosophical uh, landscape, um, this is certainly the way that I'm going to present it, certainly not the only way to present it. So Bruno kindly mentioned this, this volume um, on mental fictionism that I uh, edited uh, last year with Tamás Stimito, who's here, and Ted Parent, um, which, uh, and you can find um, uh, some, depending how you count, perhaps two or three proponents of mental fictionalism. Um, uh, so there are different ways of, of cashing it out. One, uh, Ted Parent and Meg Wallace have at least uh, suggested the idea of prefix fictionalism, even if perhaps they don't want to commit to it in all respects. Uh, Chamash has his own um, version of this that's rather different called effective storyism. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at a previous conference in Budapest, uh, Tamas is also on record as saying that I'm not a proper mental fictionalist. So if Tamas had his way, there'd just be one and I'd be out of the, uh, the camp. So we've already got those, those schisms going. Um, but at any rate, this is to say there are different ways of cashing out this, this idea. The way in which I want to, to try to explain it is to draw on a particular theory of uh, of fiction and of metaphor in particular by the philosopher Kendall Walton. And it's Walton's work that I've used in um, my book on scientific models, for instance, that takes representational art, fiction, and also at least some cases of metaphor and figurative language to involve um, pretense within what he calls games of make-believe. So I'm going to try to, to give you in the, the remaining time today an outline of this view and um, just a quick comparison to um, some of the views that I've talked about already. So here's a, a, a classic case of make-believe, of playing games. So here's, um, this is, I think, Teddy Roosevelt running off into the, to the woods with his bear. Um, uh, and um, so he's playing this game in the woods uh, in which tree stumps are taken to be bears. Right. So, and Walton gives this terminology to describe games like this. He describes tree stumps as props. Um, the um, rules that Teddy Roosevelt and the other children playing this game uh, establish as um, principles of generation. So these are the sort of rules of the game. They tell you that, for instance, tree stumps are to be imagined as bears, that they count as bears in this, this game rather than uh, spaceships or what have you. Um, and together, these props, the position of these tree stumps and this rule that these tree stumps count as bears generate what Walton calls fictional truths, right? They prescribe to imagine certain things, like that if there are three tree stumps in the clearing, there are three bears in the clearing. Now, the important point for us, of course, is that children, they never stand still, but particularly they, they don't stand still quietly while they're playing games like this. Instead, they participate. So um, they do things like scream and run away from a tree stump. And if they're playing the game, this counts as fictionally um, screaming and running away from a bear. Right. Or um, you pick up a doll and you, you do this with a lump of plastic. And if, in my case, you feel slightly silly doing this at the age of 42. Um, uh, but you, of course, in doing this, you're not simply cradling a lump of plastic, but you're, say, rocking a baby to sleep right, within the context of the game. So people um, uh, do things, children do things when they're playing games that um, are to be imagined that count as um, uh, other sorts of, of activities for instance. Now, one of the things we do when we're playing games is we participate verbally. In other words, we say things. Right? Um, you can scream and run away from a bear, um, but you can also say things like this, and these are the cases that are going to be particularly important for us. You can say, there's a bear in the thicket right? when you play this game and you run into the, um, the woods and see a tree stump there. Now, 
natural interpretation here is that um, you're not claiming there really is a bear, right? If you were looking after these children and you thought they really were saying that there's a bear, especially in uh, Exeter, you'd be quite concerned. Um, you probably actually in that case wouldn't be too concerned, but if you were in a place where their bears were known, you would be concerned. Um, the thought is though that, of course, if they're playing the game, they're only pretending, as we say, right? They're not really claiming there's a bear there, they're just pretending. But, and here's a, a key idea, the thought is by pretending in the way that they do in this game, they're indicating right, that that's the right way to pretend. And if they said, um, uh, there are no bears here, it's clear, right, that would be the wrong way to pretend, right, if there is a tree stump. In there. So in other words, the thought here is that often, even though we're pretending, we are making a genuine assertion right, by showing that this is the right way to pretend. In other words, we're claiming that our props are in such a state, um, in, cer in certain state S, right, um, such that this pretense is appropriate. In other words, in this claim, we're saying there's a stump there in the thicket. And if a child ran into the, this thicket and said, ah, a bear, and then another one said, no, 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 this is a bush, right? there's no bear here, right? um, uh, the child would have been wrong. So in other words, there's a, a certain kind of objectivity involved in these games such that given the state of the props, and given the rules of the game, there are some things you're supposed to imagine, some things that you aren't. Right? So if there's a stump that's hidden under uh, in a bush or what have you, it's still fictional that there's a bear there, even if nobody happens to notice it. Okay? People can be wrong. Now, one of Orton's um, key ideas here that I'm going to draw upon is the thought that this kind of participation in make-believe is important for explaining at least some instances of metaphor and, fi and uh, figurative language. Okay, so here's a, a key quote that I'll just read out. Where in Italy is the town of Crotone, I ask? You explain it's on the arch of the Italian boot. See the thundercloud over there, the big angry face near the horizon. It's headed this way. Speak of the saddle of a mountain, the shoulder of a highway. All of these cases, Walton claims, are linked to make-believe. We think of Italy and the thundercloud as something like pictures. Italy or a map of Italy depicts a boot. The cloud is a prop that makes it fictional. There's an angry face. The saddle of a mountain is fictionally a horse's saddle. But our interest in these cases is not in the make-believe itself, and it's not for the sake of make-believe that we regard these things as props. Make-believe is useful, he says, in these cases for articulating, remembering, and communicating facts about the props, about the geography of Italy, and so on. Okay. So the thought here is the analysis of what we're doing when we say something like Crotone's on the arch of the Italian boot right, uh, goes in roughly the same way as what the children do when they say, ah, there's a bear in the thicket. Right? We're, we're uh, making use of a particular kind of pretense. Probably we're not quite as invested in it as the children are. Um, what are we doing? Well, we're participating. We're pretending in a particular game, which is roughly the Italy as a boot game right, rather than the bears in the woods game. Um, but just as with the child in the woods, by pretending in the way that we do, we indicate that's the right way to pretend. Right? And in doing that, we make an assertion. Right? In other words, um, we say that the props are in such a state as such that, right, uh, which state? Well, the state such that this is the right way to pretend. Um, and put simply, we're saying Crotone is in this particular position on the Italian close coastline. So the thought here is that there are um, different sorts of uses of make-believe. Some, what one calls content-orientated, are about, um, like the children's game, are about uh, driven by our interest in engaging in these imagined worlds and the, fic the fictional content. Others seem to have different sorts of purposes, where what we're really interested in is the state of the props. And it's by pretending in a certain way that we manage to say something about the props. In other words, by imagining, by playing this game in Italy as a boot, we allow ourselves, via the means of pretending, something like Rome is on the shoelaces, um, uh, Crotone is on the, the arch, what have you, we give ourselves a convenient way of talking about the prop. Right? And we're not really interested in sitting there um, daydreaming about a giant boot in the Mediterranean. Um, what we're really interested in is getting someone to understand where Crotone is. Okay. And the, um, Morton's idea is that um, you can understand, as I've said, some, at least some cases of metaphor and figurative language in exactly this sort of way. Very often when people talk about metaphors, they talk about a primary and secondary domain. Right? So in this case, the, the primary domain is the domain we're interested in talking about, and this is Italy in this case. And the secondary domain is the domain that we use, as it were, to make sense of the primary one. So in this case, boots. Right? Or think about uh, the example of the clouds. We're, we're talking about the um, clouds, if we say the clouds are angry, but we're using this other domain of emotions um, in order to talk about the primary domain. 
Right? Or um, if we say someone's standing at a crossroads in their life, well, we're using uh, a particular secondary domain, journeys, traveling on roads, to make sense of the events of their life. So, so in the terminology here that Walton set up, the thought is the primary domain is the props. That's what we're interested in. Someone's life, the tree stumps, Italy. But we make sense of them by switching, as it were, into this um, particular game in which we imagine those props to generate a certain content, and that's our secondary domain. So the events in someone's life generate these fictional truths. So if they're facing an important decision, well, in the life as a journey game, that generates the truth that say they're standing at a crossroads. Okay. Now, um, my aim in the lectures is going to be to um, uh, try to apply that view to talk about the mind. Um, and I'm going to um, uh, try to motivate this by um, drawing on a particular um, myth, a very uh, uh, well-known myth about the origin of uh, mental states by um, the philosopher uh, Wilfred Sellers. So Sellers says, well, how did we get talk about the mind? Well, imagine a, um, he calls a, 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 a a, a Rileyan language that's spoken by this mythical society. So imagine that there's this uh, mythical society that um, don't have the concept of mind. How could they come up with a concept like that? And the thought is, well, along comes this visionary theorist called Jones, right, who um, comes up with a new theory of the inner. Right? Jones comes up with um, uh, a new theory that says, well, we can explain and predict the way that people behave by um, saying that they have these inner states right, with um, content, and his model for that is verbal behavior. So people say things in this society that have content, and now Jones's great innovation is to say, well, we can explain and predict people's behavior if they have those things, if we um, take them to have those things inside their head. So this is one way of motivating the representationalist view that thoughts are something like theoretical entities. Mm -hmm. And my alternative myth here is to say, well, take the same story, take Jones and this mythical society. But suppose that what Jones introduces is not um, a new theory of an inner realm, but a useful metaphor, right? He's like the first person to say it's useful to treat Italy as a boot. Um, he says, look, um, a good way to describe people is as if they had these inner states with content that we can use um, to make sense of their behavior. So, so the, the kind of core idea that I'm going to keep coming back to here is there, aren't, there are no um, uh, th there aren't these inner states. These are useful fictions, as it were. This is a useful metaphor for talking about, um, about people's um, behavior in roughly the same sort of way that talking about life as a journey is a useful way of talking about um, the events in someone's life. Okay. And later, I'm going to come back to the thought that um, there are all sorts of different sources for this metaphor within um, uh, um, language and culture more generally. So in the um, later lectures, I'm going to um, move beyond just talking about speech as a, a metaphor here and talk about all sorts of other examples of different kinds of speech and different materials. Okay. So here's just to, um, uh, to finish here, here's the uh, um, way in which this view will understand talk about the mind. Right? So think about this example. One of the ways stretching back uh, at, at least 2,000 years or so, one of the ways in which we talk about the mind um, by using an external um, a piece of material culture, as it were, is to talk about memory as if it were a kind of inner written record, an inner, inner notebook, inner wax tablet, what have you. Um, now, um, that way of talking has, a, a, um, a say, a long, a long history. Um, uh, what are the primary and secondary domains? Well, the, the primary domain is someone's behavior. The fact that, say, when uh, Bruno tells me to get a particular bus from the airport, uh, a day later, I'm able to say to myself, oh yeah, I need to get the bus from the airport, right? So there's a certain aspect of my, um, of our, my behavior there that we're trying to make sense of. And the thought I want to develop is that, the, that we should understand that kind of talk about memory, standing beliefs, as they're often called, um, as metaphorical based on this metaphor of external written records like notebooks, right? So we're, the prop in this case is people and the way they're behaving, and we're talking about them in roughly the same way that we talk about Italy as if it were a boot, we're talking about people as if they had these inner records, these inner notebooks where they can write down useful information and then look it up again um, later on. Um, so, um, now, and usually, I think, 
that game is prop orientated. In other words, we're not normally interested in the content, we're not normally interested in things like, well, what are these representations and how do they interact with each other and what format? We're just interested in making sense of whether I'll get to the bus on time or not. Um, and it's really only in philosophy uh, and other areas, perhaps like psychology, that we start to uh, daydream about these inner representations, as it were, in the same way that we might daydream about a giant boot. Um, and I want to argue that a lot of the problems that we get into, um, particularly with Cartesianism, um, stem from those. So, um, so to remind ourselves, if we say on this view something like Ruth's at a crossroads, um, and we're speaking metaphorically, we're not claiming that she's really standing at a road junction, we're just indicating correctly how to pretend in a particular game, and in doing that we make an assertion about Ruth's life, uh, namely that she faces an important decision. And the thought here is that this is the sort of thing that's going on in psychology. So I say, you know, Adam believes the number 129 goes to Tartu. Uh, I'm not claiming that I um, really have an inner representation that's causing my behavior. I'm just indicating how to pretend correctly in the memory as a notebook game. But by indicating how to pretend correctly, I do make an assertion. I make an assertion, um, or you would be making an assertion in this case about me and my behavior. You're saying um, that I'm in a certain sort of state. What state? Well, the state such that your pretense is correct. Right. Now, what I'm going to come back to, particularly in lecture three, is the thought that this is rather different to the case of um, Italy uh, and um, the life is a journey case in that there's no easy way to paraphrase what I'm saying in terms of my behavior. Right? I can just tell you that Crotone is at these GPS coordinates and I seem to have a way of saying what I wanted to say without the metaphor of Italy as a boot. Um, in this case, I want to say there isn't uh, an easy literal paraphrase of what I'm saying. But roughly speaking, you'll say I behave as if I had an inner representation with that content that's causing my behavior. Okay, so um, just to, to conclude, because I realize we're, we're running short of time, um, I, we go back to those features of thought that I mentioned. I said that folk talk about the mind seems to take thoughts to have content, to cause behavior, and to be in some sense hidden. And that Cartesianism is a way of making sense of that by saying there really are these inner states that do have causal powers, and they're hidden, um, perhaps because they're states of the of the brain. And the view that I've tried to just put on the table at the moment is to say, well, let's suppose that folk psychology is engaging in a certain kind of metaphor, which takes those thoughts to be useful fictions. And what I'm going to try to do is to show how that gives a way of reinterpreting this um, aspects of folk psychology, that it seems to take thoughts to have content, have causal powers, and to be hidden, and offer a way of reinterpreting that in later, um, later lectures. The upshot um, if you are at all uh, convinced, will be that, um, uh, well, we don't have to worry about whether the folk will be vindicated by cognitive science. So remember I said that one of the consequences of um, Cartesianism is that you seem to have to ask yourself, well, are the folk right about our inner machinery? And there's a real threat that they could be wrong and that it turns out we don't have minds. Um, there are no beliefs and desires. Um, and um, of course, by rejecting that starting point, um, we avoid that worry, right? so that um, I want to say the folk are not in the business of speculating about inner machinery. They're deploying a whole messy set of metaphors to make sense of our, of our behavior. Okay. Um, uh, um, and then there are some arguably advantages, arguably challenges that I'm going to have to come back to to convince you of this. Um, an advantage seems to be that we don't have to worry about explaining how these inner representations get content, which is a key challenge for the representationalist. Uh, why? Well, because there aren't any. Right? So, so a lot of the, the debates which I'm going to um, talk about uh, in uh, lecture four about um, uh, naturalizing, as it's put, mental representation turn out not to be an issue. Nevertheless, there is a parallel, very important challenge for mental fictionalism, which is uh, often referred to as a problem of cognitive collapse. And I'm going to come to, back to that in uh, lecture four when I talk about intentionality in more detail. Um, uh, so it looks as if there are some challenges for fictionalism against representationalism, but also uh, some advantages rather, and also some real challenges. Um, the same situation is probably true with eliminativism. Right? The advantage is we get to keep talk about the mind. We don't have to worry that our best science of the mind, say, will be connectionism and that that will show that um, there are no beliefs and desires. We get to keep uh, our folk psychology. But then there's a challenge for this view to say, well, why do you keep it if these things don't exist? 
right? Why would you keep talking about something that doesn't exist, in, um, like the mind? And, and I'm going to come back to that challenge uh, later on. OK, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks. So before we go on with questions, maybe just a warning. As you can see, this thing is being recorded, and the recording is later made public. So if you don't want to be made public in this recording, then don't ask questions. But also, if you ask questions, then you implicitly consent to being made public. Does the same okay. go for me answering them? Am yes. I allowed to? <laughs> if I'm not sure. So okay. any, any questions? OK, Heidi? So I will start with a perhaps somewhat annoying question for a conceptual anal analyst. Okay. <laughs> uh, so at least the way you phrase it at the moment, I see that at the heart of your theory is a kind of rather empirical idea that people take this talk about beliefs and de desires metaphorically. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering what kind of like empirical evidence do we have for that? Mm -hmm. um, of course, it would be a very beneficial, in some sense, maybe beneficial reading of folk psychology, but maybe some people do take it more seriously. So, so is there any kind of like empirical backing to it at all? <laughs> yes, good, qu good question. Uh, so in... Uh, I realize I'm going to have to do this with a lot of my answers, which seems very evasive to say, oh, I'll answer that in lecture, lecture two or three or what have you. I am going to come back a little bit to, to offer some, uh, if not empirical evidence, some um, uh, motivation that, uh, to think that our, our understanding of the view is metaphorical in the, in the second lecture today. Um, and I suppose that like a lot of conceptual analysis, what I'm doing there is I'm going to pose various thought experiments or um, uh, aspects of thought about folk psychology, and I'm going to rely on you agreeing with me <laughs> or rely on you sharing the intuition in order to, to motivate this idea that, that our talk is, is metaphorical. Um, uh, but more broadly, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, of course, that it's, it's uh, an empirical claim about usage, and, and, um, and I, I be very interested. I am interested at the moment in trying to think about ways in which you would test that or the right way to, to do that, which I think is, is quite right. Of course, one of the things you're likely to find is different communities. So I had a friend who uh, interacts a lot with um, people in neuroscience and cognitive science, and, and she said to me, um, you're just flat out wrong. Of course they think beliefs are you know, uh, inner states of representations, and they say all these sorts of things that show that this isn't metaphorical. Um, now, uh, and, and so, you know, then I had to fall back on saying, well, I mean the folk, not, um, not those who are theoretically invested in, in this. Interestingly, when I've presented this to people in neuroscience and cognitive science, actually the, those who I presented it to were quite receptive. Um, there may be differences there depending on which area of neuroscience they're, they're working in. Um, you know, a lot of the people I was talking to were, were sort of concerned very much at the, the level of individual neurons and their interactions and so on. So perhaps these, perhaps they're happier to let some of this be, you know, higher level stuff, as it were, be, be metaphorical. Um, so I, I think you just, I just want to say, I think you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm trying to do a little bit of, as my sociologist colleagues might say, autoethnography here to begin with. Uh, to think about what I'm trying to put aside particular theories, explicit theories of the mind, and try to reflect on ordinary usage. And that has a, a long tradition in, in um, my particular area in, in philosophy, um, but it certainly seems to be an empirical claim, and you're quite right that it needs, it needs backing up. Um, a lot of the, the difficult thing, I mean, just to go a little bit further, when you try to think about how you would test that. And I say, I'll, I'll indicate some of this this afternoon, but it is rather difficult because um, some of the things that I'm talking about are arguably not immediately obvious to the speaker. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, a lot of our, our, arguably, a lot of our talk is metaphorical without us paying much attention to it. So, so if, for instance, I was to do some experimental philosophy surveys, I'm not sure that would get at some of the questions that I'm that I'm trying to, to get out. But yes, I need, I, need to, I need to do that work. I need to find a way to do that work to back up these claims. And I'll try to get a bit closer to it this afternoon, but we'll see if that's convincing or not.
<clears throat> so thank you, thank you for this talk. And now I at least understand what you mean by Cartesianism in this context and why you don't need a separate label for identity theories. And all okay, that. I've made so some progress at yeah, least. Yeah, well, thank you. Am I back in the fictionalist camp now, Samash, on that basis? Well, I, I'm, not? unfortunately, okay. I'm going to challenge you on that. Okay, and, I'll and keep that's, going. That's what okay, I'm going to okay. do for the, for the next, uh, or in the next couple of days. Uh, I have three sets of worries now. And okay. the first set is, that's, that's, that's a mild point, I think, um, when you ask where to begin and mm. you say that there is nowhere else, else to, uh, uh, mm. to start than, than from folk psychology, I would suggest that there are at least two other starting. I certainly agree with you that answering the question, what is the mind, can be started from folk psychology or from analyzing folk psychology. And I think that's what we do. And that's, if you want to be a, a, a mental fictionalist, then that's probably the way to to do it or the point to start from. But there are alternative possibilities. You can start from phenomenology. You could say that, well, what the mind is, is primarily given in your first person experience. And in order to understand what the mind is, well, phen phenomenology is the way to, to, to proceed. Uh, and there is a third point of view, which is, which I like in a way, uh, is to start from and that goes back to one of your first slides when you have this series of questions, first asking uh, whether the mind ex exists or not and what the mind is. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you say, uh, if you start from pure ontological commitment, saying that the mind exists, that it is a natural kind and only empirical inquiry can reveal what it is, what the nature of this uh, natural kind is, then you are committed to, a, well, I would say scientific conception of the mind and you just start from an uh, empty realism. That's how I called this stance. Uh, empty. Once. Empty realism. Okay. Uh, okay. It's, you know, it's... Uh, uh, like uh, what Spinoza said about God, that it's uh, every determination is negation. So you don't want to, don't okay. want to. There is there is something. Uh, uh, there is something that's that's the mental. What that's the mind. And now let's let's start an empirical, or you know, begin an empirical inquiry into hmm. into this. Actually, that's that's something. Well, William Lycan suggests suggest that somewhere, saying that belief is an information carrying natural kind and we can identify it with it or why its contingent properties, but we, we haven't haven't got to the point where we can we can say what this thing is. So uh, I think there are alternative possibilities, but that's I don't think that's lethal to what you were saying now. Uh, a quick question. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to. to I can't. If or oh, shall, shall I shall I give all my worries at once and then go, flood go you ahead. with? Let me scribble furiously at okay. all of them and okay. then try and go back. Okay, so you, I've you, got you, three days, haven't I? So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I agree with you that folk psychology is not a theory, but you haven't told us what it is. Then, mm -hmm. uh, how would you? Or what? I would have a, uh, suggestions, and I would say that it's, uh, it can be understood as a system of conventions, uh, very much like those in language or musical composition. Uh, I, but probably that would take us to, a, uh, to, to an entirely different route uh, yeah. uh, than, uh, than what you want to, uh, want to walk on. Uh, still in this ballpark, um, I don't think, why, why should we focus on thoughts, propositional attitudes, concepts, and all Well, your slide, which was certainly before slide 14, because that's when I started to write down the numbers and so, so as to identify what you're saying. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think you have very strong arguments for focusing on, 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 on proposition attitudes and ignoring all the, all the rest, although it certainly facilitates your case. Uh, so it makes, your, makes, your, uh, your, your, makes, makes advancing your position easier in a way. Um, and the way it makes it easier, it comes through in slide 14 and 15, where you have this boss example, which is, I don't think you need folk psychology to understand that situation. Mm. It's a very routine procedure that you can, of course, rationalize or over-intellectualize uh, uh, by using folk psychology. But that's, 
I don't think we, we deploy for psychological, conceptual machinery there, even, not in the process and not even in understanding it, because there is nothing to understand there. So there is no, I would say, disturbance in the force that, mm -hmm. uh, that should be related to, you know, that's not, that's not, well, that's, okay, I think. Uh, okay, that was my second set of worries. And the third set, which comes or relates to slide 25, with principles of generation, that's where we, I, th where we uh, I think, differ the most. If you have them, if you, if you say that there are principles of generation uh, reaching from behavior to interpretation, or principles of generation to rely on to get to an interpretation from behavioral evidence, then I, I don't think you can be a proper fictionalist. But, and you can, you can be a constructive empiricist or an instrumentalist uh, uh, because you still keep folk psychology within this, uh, in the sphere of explanation and prediction. And if you do, if, if you want to do that, then you, well, at most, can be an instrumentalist or, 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 or a constructive empiricist. And this comes very clearly through in, there's a newly revised Stanford Encyclopedia article on belief mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Schwitz, 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 Eric Schwitz, okay. okay. Who is kind enough to cite our collection, this is mm -hmm. the whole collection, saying that <laughs> instrumentalism and fictionalism are not incompatible. However, fictionalism emphasizes the resemblance between belief attribution and fictional storytelling, while instrumentalism emphasizes the resemblance to devising a predictively successful scientific instrumental model. Now, I don't think that's the difference between instrumentalism and fictionalism. I think fictionalism, well, at least in my construal, is a more, more radical view. It just denies that folk psychology has explanatory or predictive uses. And if you don't deny that, if you want to keep that, I don't think you can develop a, 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 a radically different position from instrumentalism and mm -hmm. constructive empiricism. Okay, but okay. This, these are Maybe you keep it. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I think it it's probably quite likely that Tabash will have follow-ups because I've got a lot to a lot to get through. Um, let me let me try and take them in, 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 yeah. in order. And I have the feeling that there's a lot, I mean I know I won't convince you, but also that there's a lot we'll have to come back to over yeah. the next few days. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so the where to begin question. Um, uh, so you mentioned a, a couple of alternatives. Um, the the first one phenomenology. And, and first person experience. Um, now, right, so, so one thing I'm going to say um, in um, uh, later lectures is that uh, I think that, um, uh, that there is something revealed in first person experience, so sensations, you know, we have grumblings in our tummies or other sorts of sensations. Um, uh, I don't think that um, beliefs and desires in particular show up there. Um, so part of what I'm going to say is that I think that there are some things to which we have that kind of first person uh, experiential access, but not the whole of the mind. That, that the mind um, as an inner world that includes things like beliefs and desires is a much bigger commitment than that. Um, so that the inference that's sometimes made, say, in um, early modern thinkers to go from introspection to the whole of the mind as an inner world is, is one that I'm going to want to, to challenge. So, and even in the case of something like sensations, I mean, I suppose this would go hand in hand with something like Sellers' rejection of the myth of the, the given. Right? I'm going to say that even in the case of sensations, there's an interpretive step to say um, what those sensations are, whether they are associated with nervousness or hunger or what have you. And that, that's very familiar from other thinkers like Ryle. So, so I'm not denying that there are that some things that show up in our first person experience, but I think it's we can too quickly move from that um, from those things that do to other aspects of mind and in particular to the whole Cartesian um, view, which is what I'd want to, want to reject. So that's, now, now um, 
so, so that's that's one thing to say about phenomenology. But I, I will have to, to come to come back to that. Um, the 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 empty realism view that you you mentioned is something that. Um, Perhaps I'll, I'll have to ask you to, to fill out the view a little bit. I mean, the, the, the way you mentioned it from from Bill Lykins, who you said beliefs are an information carrying natural kind. Yeah. Um, so um, it, look, I mean, here I think well, perhaps this is a, a point about about naturalism, a philosophical naturalism more generally, at least as it appears in this area. I mean. It seems to me that um, you know it's important to take the results and claims of, of scientific inquiry seriously, of course. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean accepting everything <laughs> that scientists say. There are certain domains, like say metaphysical domains, in which I'm sure lots of scientists wouldn't claim to be expert or or, or want their um, views to be the final world, so, word. And I think particularly in the case of cognitive science, which is very close to philosophy and its concerns, that um, uh, we can't, as it were, uh, just read off, I know, I know this isn't quite what you were suggesting, but read off a commitment to, say, beliefs and desires just from the cognitive science. You know, very often it's beginning from particular philosophical commitments um, and developing theories on the basis of that. And partly what I'm trying to do is to challenge those philosophical commitments. So for instance, in the case of belief as a, a, an information carrying natural kind, I see that that has great utility within certain areas. Um, but I guess one of the claims of the fictionist is going to be to say you can have that utility without the commitment. Um, and that's familiar from all sorts of areas, but that will bring us to instrumentalism. I know. Yeah, yeah, just, just a quick, uh, may, maybe I just wanted to say that Folk psychology may not be uh, may not be constitutive in understanding what the mind is, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you say that it's not universal, ahistorical, that uh, oh, historical, sorry, mm -hmm. which I I agree with that very much. Mm -hmm. But then uh, the question, what is the mind, may not be answered through the concepts of or, or, of folk psychology, and I think that's. Mm -hmm. uh, that has that, that this kind of stance has affinities to the to to, to, to mental fictionalism at least the way yes. I, I conceive it. Yes, I, I I think you're right. Of course, the the, the difficulty is that there are the, at least as I understood the position you were mentioned calling empty realism, it seemed to take the reality of the mind as it were as a starting point. That there is something. I I, I mean, even saying thing is perhaps worrying. There is something that we are scientific we are scientifically investigating and entitled to take to exist. And I take it that, for instance, behaviorism would claim to be a scientific approach, at least on some interpretations, that rejects that starting point. So there is behavior, there's sophisticated human behavior that we need a theory uh, framework to understand. But at least if you're, say, Skinner, you think that the mind is a sort of um, particular kind of construct that um, has got to go. And I suppose Churchland would fit roughly into that category too. If we take the mind to include a commitment to say beliefs and desires, uh, well, that's something that does not figure in our best yeah, science. But, uh, as I take it, this right. empty kind of realism is uh, sort of, well, uh, uh, logically prior to, to any kind of inquiry into what we, if you don't, if you don't mm -hmm. think that mm -hmm. something exists, irrespective of your knowledge of it, of it, then you wouldn't inquire into it, right? Phlogiston, including. In order to mm. start an inquiry into what phlogiston is, you yeah. need to take a commitment to, an ontological commitment, that this thing exists. That's, well, some kind of commitment. Yes. It doesn't have to be a full-blown full acceptance, but some kind of acceptance, some kind mm. of commitment. Mm. Okay. But, yeah, I, well, let's come back to, I mean, I have yep. the feeling that at least as you say that now, it sounds at odds with natural. I mean, it sounds, yeah, maybe we should come back to yeah, it. Yeah, if, yeah. if we take a prior commitment, we're not willing to revise. And it's not then, central anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so the, 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 just to move, to move on to some of the other issues you raised. Yeah. Um, so, so you said it, it, if, if psychology is not the theory, what, what is it? Um, so... Uh, now, when I said it's not a theory there, I was operating with the view of theories that 
you often find in those classic debates in philosophy of mind that arguably is, is um, not so popular nowadays in philosophy of science. So I think the view I'm going to put forward over the nature of folk psychology is um, fairly consistent with current views on the structure of theories in philosophy of science, which is roughly speaking, they're a set of models. Right. So a lot of people within philosophy of science now would say, well, what they often call the received view of theories, that they are um, sets of universal generalizations with um, bridge laws or something that connects those generalizations to the, to the world, um, should go in favor of a, a theory that says, well, say Newtonian mechanics is a collection of models like the simple harmonic oscillator or um, you know, the damped oscillator or what have you, free fall, that... Um, to some extent, to some degree, apply to various situations in the world. And I suppose that slightly uh, messier, piecemeal version of theories is roughly what I want to say about folk psychology, that it's a, it's a sort of grab, grab bag of different metaphors for making sense of behavior. Um, and, um, and so if you wanted to call that a set of models, that would be not so far from. So. And modeling what on what? So modeling in the case of thought, so we talk about modeling uh, human behavior in the first instance without tools on the basis of human behavior with tools. In other words, modeling what we do when we don't write things down, for instance, on what we do when we do write things down and keep information in the case of memory, for example. So one aspect of human activity modeled on another is in the case of thoughts. But it, but it may well be in other aspects of the mind, I'll touch briefly on this, that, that there are other metaphors, there are other um, uh, um, kinds of models that come in. Can I, shall I come back to, to the, just, just to come to some of the other um, issues you raised, unless you're keen to move on? Yeah, well, I'm sorry if I'm... I'm happy to, to carry on replying to some of Tamash's points. If, uh, a minute. Yeah, sure. We, we can oh, okay, okay, I've got, yeah, yeah. got notes, yeah. <laughs> so thanks a lot for the presentation it was really interesting uh, I don't know if I understood correctly or not but it seemed to me like the mental fictionalism is something like a subject is fictionalizing all the time about the world is surrounding the subject. Hmm. In that case, um, how that can subject can um, differentiate some fictions from other fictions, or how they can be certain kind of hierarchy of fictions. What I'm trying to say is this, if a subject is fictionalizing about the external world, hmm. but also reading works of fiction, on the Karenina, let's say, mm -hmm. then writing some things, creating some additional fictional work, um, how can a person understand which one is more real or not? Mm -hmm. I'm asking this because we know that um, even if you are a fictionalist, you will think that, okay, the external world is more real or more important or more serious than the fiction that you are actually reading or writing or something like that based on what we can actually create this hierarchy of fictions, let's say. Mm, I mm. don't know if it makes sense or not. I think, I think, so. I, I think so. Let me try and re um, give you a few initial mm. thoughts in response and then see, see if this addresses your worry. So I think it's um, characteristic of at least a lot of the situations that I'm talking about, uh, and this is a, a characterization that the, an early, the early fiction is Hans Weyinger puts and Kwame Antia Appiah has, has, has picked up on this too, that, that as it were, we're aware of the truth um, and we're aware that the fiction that we're operating with departs from the truth. Um, so uh, now, so in other words, we're, we're in, in, if we think about the case of scientific models, we're aware very often that there is friction really in the system. We may not be able to measure it exactly, um, but we just think that for the purposes that we're interested in, we can safely ignore it for instance, uh, or we know that molecules are not tiny billiard balls, but also we know that if we tried to, to add in all the gory detail that we think is there, we wouldn't be able to apply a theory. And so, so, so in a sense, the fictionist view is not, as it were, a skeptical 
position, at least it's understood like that. It's a, it, it's, so for instance, a lot of what I would say about fictions in modeling, in scientific modeling, would be no surprise to scientists. You know, they're, they're constantly, when constructing a model, perfectly well aware of which, which aspects are false but useful in various, in various ways. Um, so, so that's one. Now, one complication to that, which may be part of your, your worry, is that, um, and it perhaps goes back to the first question about empirical evidence for this, that um, uh, in the case of many uh, fictionalist positions, the thought is that um, we're often not attending to their literal truth most of the time. And it's only when we're pushed by somebody who's extremely literal, like a philosopher, and they say, do you really mean this? Do you really mean that we sort of are forced to come out of our ordinary game and, and, and pay attention to it? And perhaps as a result of that, the answers we give there are more controversial as to, you know, if someone hasn't really... Uh, you know, asked you uh, whether you think numbers exist, for instance, and whether that's part of your normal counting, or it takes a moment for you to adjust and think, well, yes, what, what, what am I trying? What am I committed to there, or, or not? Um, but so, um, but th that's so. In the case of for fiction, that like you mentioned Anna Karenina, I mean, the the thought here is, well, there's a, a kind of rough parallel. It, at least as I understand the view, that says, well, scientific models very often, they ask us to imagine the world in a certain way. Some of what they, their content, what they ask us to imagine is true. Um, you know, there really is a ball rolling down the sl and there really is a slope. Some of what they ask us to imagine is false, say that there's no friction. And the competent user of those models has got to be um, uh, able to navigate those differences, but but it's quite quite right to say that part and parcel of that is we can make mistakes. So there's a, a lovely quote that I, I mentioned in a previous talk um, that uh, said, "Oh well, there was a, a, a dunce in a, a Victorian chemistry class who was asked what are atoms, and he said, oh, they're square blocks of wood invented by Dr. Dalton.' Right. So the and and there are more serious worries that lots of people had about imagining in this case molecules to be little solid." balls that, that you can go wrong. Um, some of the ways you go wrong are fruitful, some of them are not. Um, so I, I suppose the answer to that question is I suppose there's no general way of going wrong there, um, but it's a matter of sort of competent practice within the particular areas that you're, you're interested in, holding what's true and what's fictional um, in mind. Yeah, right, but we may have you. to come back to... <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. I think we have to stop. We have a time here. Time is up. Thank you.